Hey, how you doing? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for coming on this platform. I really appreciate you taking out the time to stop by. Well, the StreamYard is about as easy as Zoom. All the other ones are so hard. I was, uh, it's uh, good, good, good. It's, and thank you for inviting me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's an honor. Um, so for the guests who may not recognize you, could you let them know who you are and what you do? Yeah, this is uh, Scott Rosell. I'm a, a professor at Stanford University. I'm an economist, development economist, and I've worked on rural China for 43 years, <laughs> a long time. So, and uh, uh, so it's, and it's uh, good to be here. Definitely, definitely. You've been doing it for a long time. That's very inspiring. Now, can I ask you, what courses do you teach? So I'm, uh, I, I teach a class called uh, The Chinese Economy, um, Past, Present, and Future. I teach it with my colleague and uh, co-director from the Stanford Center on Chinese Economy Institutions named Hongbing Li. And uh, yeah, we, we, we basically look at China from you know the, the economics of 2,000 years ago all the way through today and uh, uh, really try to put it in perspective about you know uh, you know where, where China is, how it, how it's developing, what's happening in the future. Wow. Okay. Okay. That's very interesting. I can ask you, um, when did you develop this interest in uh, China, Chinese history, <laughs> agriculture, and economics? So, 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 um, China, yeah, was was um, in the 1960s, early 1960s. Um, China broke with the Soviet Union. Um, you know, they're friends again, <laughs> but but they broke with the Soviet Union and the United States government turned around and said, oh, my gosh, we can't control communism with Russian. We need Chinese, too. So they put these Chinese language classes in schools, public schools all over the U.S. And they happened to pick mine where well, I'm from a southwest uh, uh, I'm sorry, Southeast LA County uh, uh, community called Bellflower. And um, it, so I got a, I got a sheet of paper in, in sixth grade that said, do you want to take Chinese? And I took it to my dad. My dad had been in World War II and was on a repair ship. And after Hiroshima and the war is over, everyone goes back to the U.S. except his ship gets sent to Shanghai. Um, and they're bringing the landing craft over, repairing them and giving them to, to, the, to the KMT to fight the communists. That didn't help. Um, but uh, so my dad spent a whole year in China when he was a you know 17 year old boy. And he said, it's so interesting. You should take it. And so I said, yeah, I mean, I was 12 years old. So uh, and so I took I took six years of language class through junior high and high school with four other people. And those four other people, one went to the Navy, one went to the State Department, one went to the CIA. And me, I grew my hair long. I went to Berkeley and tried to overthrow the American government as we protested against the Vietnam War. So, so that's my long uh, sort of just, I just happened to fall into it. So, and, and then, you know, when I was in Taiwan, uh, so in the seventies, I went to Taiwan because we couldn't go to China and I was, became a mentoree of a professor, a development economics professor who took me all over Taiwan at that time. And he's the one that got me interested in development. So it was development in Asia and, um, uh, there it is. Uh, uh, that's what I've been doing for the last 43 years. Wow, that's amazing. That's inspiring. I mean, at least for your dad to be able to go to China at 17 and then you be able to come full circle and now you, you know, you're teaching it. Um, but I, I, just, I, I, just, I just, my, 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 my son, son just, just, my son was son just with just me in Shanghai. Shanghai. He works for Tencent. Uh, he actually works for Riot.com, which is a, a subsidiary of Tencent. And he was in Shanghai with, uh, he does esports with the his colleagues and and I took him to the exact place where my my dad's boat was uh, uh, basically parked for for a year. So so we've had three generations now through through China. 
Wow, that's really, really cool. I, I got a chance to visit China, but I didn't get to stay long. It was like a layover. I think I was in uh, Wuhan and maybe Shanghai, but I, I spent some time in Hong Kong and Taiwan is nice too. I, I was there for about a week or two. I really enjoyed it. Well, you know, China is a big, big place, and it's it's also changed a lot over. I always say I've been to five Chinas: the China of the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000s, the 2010s, and now. Uh, and so, it's uh, I've been going to different countries every 10 years. <laughs> wow, that's amazing that you share that. Now, can I ask you um, when you're teaching this information to students of today? Are they able to, um, I guess, understand the relevance and how important it, it is to obtain this information, especially like you're saying, it's changing every decade? Yeah, yeah well, I think, I mean, there's, there's no doubt the U.S.-China relationship on so many dimensions is one of the most important in the world, right? Uh, um, our, our economies are very much intertied with investments in into China with you know imports back to uh, you know back here I've heard it said that if we broke relations with China like we did with Russia two years ago after the Ukraine started Ukraine war, is our whole economy would probably fall 20 percent um, just because so many things that it's imports parts uh, and and then our in investments there and so we're very much in tide. But obviously, there's lots of sort of national security uh, uh, dimensions to our relationship now, and uh, so we're we're tied together like his, and you know we have this you know um, uh, a, a competition, a, a, a collaboration, all at the same time. Um, so I think it's it's extremely important to to understand that, right? And uh, um, and the the other thing is is you know. Um, you know, the, the, most of the world, most of the information we get about China comes from two sources, one, the press and one sort of think tanks that are, you know, uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, set up. And, you know, the, the, I, I think a free press is great, but a free press makes their money by selling stories and bad news stories sell. And so that's what we, we hear that side of, of China. Um and a lot of it's true. There's, come on, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens in the United States and there's a lot of good stuff. Same thing in China, except if you haven't been there, you don't see the good side, right? I mean, you know, the, 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 the people there, you know, the professionals and the, the academics and the students are, you know, you know, they actually really, really admire the United States, <laughs> you know, and, and Europe and, you know, the West, uh, uh, you don't see that, you know, on there. So that's why it's important to to keep this interaction going. I mean, um, we, you know, the, this is a relationship we don't want falling apart. Definitely, definitely. Now you have a book. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> uh, called Invisible China. So, um, uh, and it, it's a in in I, I would say it's the, the Invisible China you know, is uh, the rural part of the population. So it's, uh, uh, China has 1.4 billion people um, uh, that two thirds of them uh, have a rural, let, let me step back one thing. China is a very special country in one sense in that every single person is born with a huko or a residency uh, um, you're either an urban person or a rural person. Um, I, I, I joke and say you're either born or you're tattooed with urban or rural here. Um, and uh, it's really hard to get that tattooed undone, but it, you don't have a tattoo. You have a, you have a, you have a residency card and, um, that they're extreme, especially historically, there's little changes happening now, but historically, these are two very divided classes, right? And um, um, that rural people can't go to the cities for education. They can't go to the cities for, for health care. They can't go to the cities for uh, welfare and other, um, uh, so other benefits. Um, they have to get them from their rural areas and the rural areas are much, much poorer than the urban areas. Um, so what, and you know, that's, 
850 million people, right? Um, one out of every nine people in the world is a rural Chinese, okay? And so that's who I, you know, are looking at and look at their rise, uh, look at their problems and um, really trying to understand how, um, you know, that this part of China is going to affect the overall development of China and then the welfare of the people. So uh, that's what's Invisible China about. And, um, you know, that the, the good news and bad news, you know, when, when you know, as China rose and their incomes went up, if they, as they saw a lot of these problems happening, they solved a lot of them. So rural China is much, much, much bigger, better. My, my, my 2020s China is so much better than the 1980s China um, in terms of, you know, um, housing and healthcare and education and um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's much, much worse than the urban areas, <laughs> which went up much, much higher. But, uh, you know, people were very happy, um, even, even though there was inequality, that they had come up over time. Uh, now that the last five, 10, five, especially, po especially post-COVID, last two or three years, the economy has really sort of stagnated. And, and, and in some sections gone down, um, the, the rural people are the ones that, you know, have the biggest propensity to be hurt. And uh, so the, in uh, the, the, that, that's what I study. So, uh, you know, the, the, the causes and effects and where they're going and um, what needs to be done. Wow, I appreciate you sharing that information. A lot of people, you know, take um, what you said for granted. You know, so many things have um, affected our economy in terms of the relationship that we have in China. You know, a lot of the things that we consume now, can I can ask you, have you ever considered or um, thought about doing like a documentary based on some of the research or your book? <laughs> uh, uh, no. <laughs> I mean, would I would I do it? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. We, you know, we're we're very lucky. It's, you, you know, with U.S. China relations being tense, many academics aren't able to go, you know, to China and do work. But because mine you know, basically, you know, working on, on China, mainly human capital in rural China, uh, schooling, health, and early childhood development, these are pretty, they're not very national security problems. Babies in rural China don't affect national security. I've been able to keep working. So we're working really hard now, um, you know, with, uh, I, when I say I'm working hard, my former students who are professors in China now, um, former uh, colleagues who, who work there and have their own programs, we're, we're very, very, very busy. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, you have a documentary maker who wants to make a documentary on us? <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I do a lot of talks and um, I'm, I'm very interested in, in taking uh, what's happening China to the world. Like I said, a big part of our problem is that we don't understand China very much. Um, uh, so uh, like I said, I'm a co-director of, of a center called the Stanford Center on Chinese Economy Institutions. We have one program we do that's called Impact Program. And what, what we do is every, we do several things, but every two weeks we take a very high quality academic paper that you can't understand, Tao. <laughs> Most of them I can't understand. They're so complicated. But we take it and we work very hard and translate this into a two-page uh, brief called a policy brief that uh, you know it says you know, a seven-minute read. And what we try to do to 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 the readers of this is to explain what's going on in China, the economy, international relations. Uh, lo local politics and everything. And, um, uh, it, you know, we send it to tens of thousands of people every week. So I, I think that that's what I'm, you know, that's what I'm working a lot on is uh, really trying to, in, you know, that's, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, what we're thinking. Well, th these policy briefs are very interesting. One third of them say, you know how bad China is? It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, one third of them say, you know how bad China, you know how bad we think China is? In fact, it's not so bad. And, and, 
And then a third of them are FYI, this is what's happening over there, um, sort of more or less neutral. But uh, when people come and complain to us, we write a pro-China one. The anti-China people say, you know, why do you love China, you panda hugger? Well, I tell them, you know, every one of these policy brief is based on papers that are based on data. I go, you don't like these results? Go look at the data, right? And uh, so that's the kind of stuff we're, we're trying to do to, to make this relationship uh, hold together. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now I was going to ask you about that. Um, have you um, encountered more or less or roughly the same amount of like, you know, pushback from people? Because it's, it's, I guess it's kind of controversial. Some people are either on this side or that side of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in, in this impact group, the, the program that we have, we've had a very rich relationship, deep relationship with the a think tank in Washington, D.C. called um, CSIS, which is yeah, a moderate think tank. They, they look at both sides of things. And um, we do features about three or four times a year. And there's a website and and they get sent out to, you know, tens of tens, yeah, tens of thousands of people also, uh, you know, watch these. And we get a lot of pushback both ways. <laughs> you know, what, like we do something pro-China, people people come out and say, you know, why, why are you doing this? Um, again, I, you know, what, what I try to say is, you know, our group really tries to focus on issues that have data to back them up, right? And, uh, um, you know, if you don't like the answer, uh, you know, come on. And the other thing is, you know, we want to show you both sides of the thing. We want to show you what's happening there, right? And, you know, if you don't like it, um, you know, go over and see yourself or, um, you know, um, uh, and and believe me, it happens from the other side too, right? I mean, oh, we just finished a, a paper with, was with one of my colleagues who's a sociologist professor from Harvard. You, you know, Harvard, there's a little university in the East Coast. Uh, you may not have heard of it. It starts with an H, right? <laughs> That's a Stanford joke. Uh, <laughs> uh, with, with with Marty, we wrote a paper that said from from optimism to pessimism, and it was about how how basically poor people, most of them rural, used to be very optimistic about the future, and now there's lots of concern and rising pessimism. Oh my God! It went viral in China, uh, it, you know, and and. There was a lot of negative pushback on us. You know, why are you doing this? Are you trying to undermine us? And we said, no, it's important that you guys know this, right? Look, look at, you know, look at the paper closely. And we're saying, you know, it's COVID related. It's, you know, the deterioration of international relations. It's the rise of social media. It's, you know, these are the things behind that. But these things are still there. So you need to try to, you know, make sure that, you know, they don't, you know, erupt, right? That you keep the trimmer. So uh, yeah, we get, we get the pushback from both sides, but um, uh, that that's sort of the name of the game. Okay. Okay. I appreciate you breaking that down. Now I can ask you about this. I got a chance to check out some of your videos online and you have spoke about um, it takes 40 years to change a labor force. If you could uh, kind of talk about what does it take to make that change happen? And is that across the board or, you know, well, well, yeah, so to, to, to take a quick step back, um, uh, you know, I'm interested, I'm a development economist. I want, I'm interested in, in how countries develop. There's a fantastic graph that in these videos, you always see them, right? Which is, um, you know, let's look at all the countries in the world over the past 60, 70 years. And um, there's a group of countries called poor, poor. They were poor 70 years ago, poor today you know, Congo and uh, Laos and those, you know, kind of kind of countries. And then there's the rich, rich, which are, you know, OECD countries, the, you know, England, France, Canada, the US, uh, Germany, right? And so um, what I'm interested in are the two sets of countries that are called the graduates, okay? And these are a set of countries that were middle income 60 years ago, and today they're high income. And the amazing thing is, as you, as you probably saw in the videos, there are not many of them, right? It's uh, South Korea, Ireland, Israel, um, uh, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore. They're not all countries, right? <laughs> Taiwan, right? These, these are the, some of the few 
countries that have actually made it. It's really hard to go from middle income to high income today. I mean, it's just, and 70 years, only, only a handful of countries have done it, right? And then there's the trapped. That's for 70 years. <laughs> um, these countries have been in middle income. So they grow and they stagnate. They grow and they collapse. And then, and they've been in middle income. For, so one thing difference between the graduates and the trapped, okay, is um, the level of education in those countries when they're middle income countries. So, so um, high income countries like the United States, you know, 80% of our population has been to high school or above. Why is that important? Well, when you get to high school and above, you learn computers and science and uh, uh, math and language. Those are the kinds of skills you need for a, a, a white collar job, right? Um, yeah, we still have we still have twenty percent of a population that doesn't have those skills. They have a lot of problems in a in a in a high income country like ours, right? We know we have we have a big problem with with, with that part of our our, our but we still have eighty percent of them that have, and that's why the United States we grow at two percent a year. You know, have good productivity growth. You know, despite our problems, right? And and um, um, it's so that's 80. So if you look at the graduates, what you find is when they were middle income, for some reason, they had almost everyone in their economy, in their labor force has gone to high school or above. OK, um, you know, Taiwan had 75 percent of its people had gone to high school by the time they were middle income. And so when they went from middle income to high income, Everybody could shift from behind a factory, a, you know, a textile mill. They could go become an accountant or or a hotel manager, right? And and so um, you know, it's it's a it's a very very you know important thing to have this educated. Um, the countries like Mexico or South Africa or Brazil or Argentina that have been in they've been mired in the middle income trap for seventy years. You know what happens is as they start to grow and get near high income. They don't have enough people for this white, you know, two thirds of the labor force can't do a white collar job. You know, in the United States, 10 percent or 15 percent, we need them to be nannies and landscapers and, you know, you know, truck, truck, not even even truck drivers today need to need to have some skills. Right. But um, uh, but but you don't need 60 percent. And that has been one thing that's held those countries back. So, so what I say, let me jump to China, is can China go from middle income to high income, right? And it's gone from poor to middle income in one of the fastest growing economies in history, right? But it's now at middle income. And guess what? It has one of the lowest educated labor forces in the upper middle income world. So compare them to Mexico, Turkey, South Africa, Thailand, China's China only has about between 30 to 35 percent of its labor force um, has ever been to one day of high school. Um, that means 600 million people don't know math, science, language or computers. And, you know, how can you turn into a high income country with, with an education level like that? So and, and most of those uneducated people, guess what, are rural people. <laughs> right. And, uh, um, you know, so my entire academic focus has been on trying to improve the human capital of the, the rural labor force. And they've made lots and lots of progress. There's a long ways to go. You know, I, I think China's going to face substantial problems because of that. Um, uh, and there's other problems, too. There, there's a lot of other. I mean, the United States has a lot of problems. China has a lot of problems. I think one that the that, that China has is this. The, the education level of their labor force. I know that's a little long response, but I think it's very important. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we really see countries like Mexico and Brazil stepping back and saying, God, why are we still in middle income? And they say, hey, maybe it's the human capital of our labor force. Let's start investing in zero to three and preschool and elementary school and try to get, you know, the entire labor force um, uh, 
40 years from now. Yeah. So, you know, you, you put a baby today into um, uh, early childhood development programs and their parents, right, into, into programs. Guess what? You know, it's 40 years from now, <laughs> they'll be working in your labor force. So um, uh, that's the 40 years from now. So start now. Um, you know, that's my uh, that's sort of my my saying. Because because you can't do anything about it once they once they get out. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm processing the information that you share with me. I appreciate you taking the time to uh, go into that because I'm a, I'm a world traveler. I've been to like 70 countries, and like you say, it's certain places I'll go and I'll see the changes over the years, but they kind of get stuck. And what I've noticed, like like I go to Latin America. I'm in Ghana now, so I've been about 20 African countries it's a lot of poverty and you see children like elementary school children, middle school children, they're in the streets. They don't go to school. You know, maybe they have to pay for it and they don't have the money. It's just not something that they can just go sign up for. But like you say, by the time they're 20 and 30 and 40 and they haven't been educated, then that affects the entire population, you know, so they have to invest it's in it now. Part, right? And it, if, if everybody else is educated and you aren't, then you get, you get pressed down and, you know, do you start, are there problems that are, have to, so, so I've been to 87 countries, um, except I've only been to three African countries. So you need to be my, um, you need to be my um, uh, sort of mentor on that side. So it's, uh, but uh, great. It's, uh, I'll take you to Asia. You take me to, to, to Africa. Okay. So it's, it's, oh it's, yeah. That's a deal. That's amazing. Yeah, that, that's about 30 fine. years younger than me too. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's cool. I'm glad you shared that because because, yeah, like I, I studied abroad in Dominican Republic and, you know, they get the tours, they get the money flowing in. But I, I was while I was studying, I was volunteering at an orphanage and they didn't have, you know, those children had never seen a computer before. So I would bring my laptop up there. I would let them play the math games just to engage them. You know, they're excited just to be on the computer. But, you know, learn how to add this, learn how to, you know, read this and do this and do that. And it's just amazing. But at the same time, it's sad. So you know, it's sad, right? I mean, because you know, you need you need what we know now is you need to start at you know six. You need to start in mom's belly, right? And uh, uh, you know, you need the health, education, nutrition, and early childhood development that that'll let you know you maximize uh, if you want to if you want to try to survive in a chat GPT robotized you know, automated world, it's, it's, it's changing a lot, as you know, right? And if you don't change with it, you're going to have trouble. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah, we're about 30 minutes in, uh, about 28 minutes in. So I just want to thank you again for taking out the time to stop what you was doing to come by and share this, um, this amazing amount of information that you have, you know, to see you do something for 40 years. Some people, you know, they don't work a job that long or they don't live that long. They haven't been on earth that long. So that's really inspiring and motivating. And I definitely look forward to the work that you have coming in the future. Great, great. Uh, and I appreciate you. you I want to make sure you give me a copy of this. And I've been starting to follow your your, your podcasts they're very interesting it's uh, it, pe people uh, people haven't done this for 40 years because there hasn't been podcasts for 40 years but uh, uh, I'll, 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 I've got the calendar going now okay watching you <laughs> okay okay well I want to thank you again and thank the viewers as well so until next time thank you yeah we'll be in touch yeah.